Good morning and welcome to Garden with Peggy. And today it looks like it's going to be a beautiful day, right? It's supposed to be in the low 60s. Is that right? Yeah, 66. And oh, 66. It's supposed to be 66. Sun is out. I don't know what I'm going to work on this afternoon, but I'll work on something. Um, maybe the veggie garden. Maybe it's time to work on the veggie garden. So um, I should give the phone number. It's 888-399-7344. That 7344 is Peggy, P-E-G-I. Um, remember, you can find us by going to YouTube and streaming for, uh, looking for Garden with Peggy, and it should pop right up if you do a search. And good morning, Rob F., and good morning, my dear friend, Nancy, who have already sent me comments, which is so cute. So this is all good. And again, you can see us on YouTube and Facebook, and we're doing reels and Instagrams and uh, what else? 200. Oh, yes. And we, uh, my husband wanted me to thank everybody because we have hit 201. Uh, subscribers, which was sort of uh, 200 was the next goal. I don't know what the next goal is after that, 250, 300. I don't know. It's going to be a while. They say it takes over a year to get to 1,000. And when you get to 1,000, then things start happening. So only 800 to go, but we're um, we're moving forward at a slow and steady pace. So uh, let's see. What have we got here? Um, this week, right? Yeah, let's, as, as usual, we'll start the show with This Week at Tiny Farm. And yes, there was a, a lot of stuff going on this week at Tiny Farm. So let's let's go to those. Ah, this is um, the front of the house. and That's my wizard statue. I love my wizard statue. And that is a, a witch's ball that is the, the wizard is holding. It is a glass sphere. And I'm amazed that it has lasted like four years. Um, nobody's broken it. So I don't know, maybe I'm, maybe I shouldn't have said that, but um, maybe that'll be a curse, but um, I do love it. It's, you know, I think it looks more like Gandalf than Dumbledore, but either way, um, he's holding a purple sphere, which is perfect for the house. And around him in front is are the uh, crown imperials that I planted in the fall. Those are very expensive bulbs and they have a lot of distinct advantages. Uh, one of which is nobody will eat them because they're, they're poisonous and they, they taste terrible. So that is one real advantage of disadvantages. They're very expensive and you should always handle them with gloves, uh, especially the bulbs because they have uh, some toxicity in them, which is also the same reason why nobody will eat them. So that is, uh, that's almost, uh, that's a benefit. But you can see, I'm a little disappointed in how small they are. Maybe it's just because they're it's first year. When I had them at Blooming Acres, the one that I had was there, it was probably there 20 years, right? It was in the back in 20 years. And it actually grew up through um, a quince, a flowering quince, and it bloomed above the bush. So it got to be at least four feet tall. And it spread. There were multiple branches or uh, stalks per bulb that started out as one. And I ended up with like six after all of those years. So I'm hoping these will spread and get bigger as well. But uh, Crown Imperials, Fritillaria, there are other Fritillarias. Uh, but this one, uh, and I'm surprised it's blooming so early. I, I would have interpreted it as blooming later, um, generally speaking. But here it is. So that's it. It's kind of orange. There's also yellow ones, but this one, these are orange. So, uh, I just thought I'd throw this in. This is a current picture of the greenhouse. Um, we actually have pulled a few things out of the greenhouse since I took this picture and moved them outside, but it just looks so lush. It's really, I love hanging out in the greenhouse. I, I go into and spend time in the greenhouse almost every day, right? Right. Tommy, almost every day. Yeah, every day. I'm out in the greenhouse doing something, watering, pruning, dividing, working on seeds. I'm always doing something. And the cat likes to hang out with me in the greenhouse as well. Next. Um, oh, this is my burrow's tail. Um, and this is, uh, it's blooming. And you can see the flowers, while they're not huge, they are all at the very tips of the hanging down burrow's tails. And they are such a pretty color. So even though they're small, they draw the eye. 
and I have seen it bloom before, but uh, it doesn't bloom that often. So I still get very excited when I see the flowers. I harvested these from my lemon tree and I made great lemon water. I used two lemons. They were so juicy. And I, I did, I admit it, I put a little bit of sugar in there. Not a lot, just a little bit too. Uh, and it's really delicious. But these lemons are from my Myers lemon tree. And uh, I didn't even harvest them all, but that's most of them. And this beautiful picture is actually across the street. There's a cemetery across the street. And this garden bed has been badly neglected. And about two, I, I learned that um, Mrs. Lang that used to own my house, tiny farm, uh, used to garden over there. And she's the one who used to plant flowers, but obviously she's been gone a very long time. And it was a mess. But about two years ago, the Boy Scouts came and they did some planting. I do not remember seeing them plant all of these daffodils. They did put in all the the brickwork or it's not bricks. What do we call that? Paving stones. Yeah. And, um, and most of the shrubbery that they put in there died. But apparently the daffodils have done quite well. So they're very cheery. That's what I'm seeing when I look out my front window right now. Oh, look at this. Isn't this cool? This is my flying dragon. And someone else, was it Mary from Warren, called and said she had a flying dragon? Um, yeah, this is my flying dragon. And you have to be very careful where you plant this. You don't want to put it any place where you're going to bump into it. I have a really good spot for it. It's actually in a corner behind a fence. So you can't bump into it too easily. Um, I have uh, the wooden fence that you can see in the picture behind it. But I also have perpendicular to that a wrought iron fence that I use to control the comings and goings of the dogs. And when that gate is open, it ends up being creating a triangle and that's where the flying dragon is. So it's, you can't really get to it from any side. It takes an effort because those pointy spines are really vicious, very cool looking, very interesting, very healthy, doing well, relatively slow growing. It's um, in the hardy orange family. Uh, and it's getting flowers. I've this, it's never bloomed for me before. And those buds have not yet opened, but they will any second. And I think it looks really cool just in the bud stage. It looks like it has twinkle lights on it. And so uh, if you see one of these and you're interested in the unusual, this is definitely a plant you may want to get your hands on. Oh, this is another thing that's very exciting. These are uh, lilies. These are the tree lilies. And it appears that they have multiplied rather dramatically. And uh, I planted four initially, and this is really only one. So the bulb must have divided underground. And for those of you who don't remember, this is the tree lily from last year. And if you look at the base, you can see uh, it's just a single stem in that same spot. And you can see how big it is, which is why it's called a tree lily. Now, this one was about six feet tall. They can get 10 feet tall. Um, I was hoping that this year it would get that tall. Uh, I think that's less likely if the bulb divided, but we'll, we'll see what happens. It's going to be interesting no matter what, but the fact that it divided is kind of cool. This is another thing that has me very excited. It doesn't look like much. The picture does not look like anything glamorous or beautiful, but do you know what this is? Tommy, do you know what this is? He's making a face and looking at it. Do you have any idea? This is the hardy bananas. The hardy bananas. I attempted to grow them several years ago and they did not overwinter, but this one I really fussed over and there's uh, five of them, three on one side, two on the other side. And they're all coming back. So uh, it looks like, you know, the tips of them may have gotten a little bit frosted. Maybe they started to grow in the warmer weather. I don't know. But it looks like they're going to make it. So hardy bananas. And they do die down to the ground every year. That's normal. But they, uh, you know, you have to keep your fingers crossed that they're going to come back. But I once established, they should come back every year. So these clearly made it through this year. So uh, we should. They don't have produce edible bananas, but, and this is Susan. And this is my magnolia that blooms very late. 
relatively speaking, to the other magnolias. And I've never had it be frosted. And it has a history because I had to transplant it at one point. And I was really worried that it wasn't going to make it. We had planted it initially in front of the wooden fence over by the big ugly building before the big ugly building went in. And it's a dwarf. It only gets to be 12 to 15 feet high and that's maximum and it's very slow growing. So as a shield, a visual shield so that we don't see the big ugly building is kind of worthless for that. But I, it was planted in honor of my friend Susan who passed away. So, you know, it was very important to me. So I, I moved it and I cut it back real hard. Um, and it took a year or so to look like anything, but this is it. And that's a close up of the flowers. They really are quite beautiful. So I'm very pleased that it is doing so well. So what's next? Oh, look at this one. Um, this is a daffodil. It, it's advertised as red. They lie. It's not red, but it's the closest to red I've seen. It is very deep, corally orange, and it's really quite stunning with the white background, the, with the white petals, but uh, it's not red, but it is called red. And it just, it's a late blooming. It's very late blooming. It's just blooming, just blooming now which is um, makes it kind of special for another reason. It extends your daffodil season. So, oh, do you remember this plant on the right? I showed you this a while ago um, and had little flower buds on it. Eventually it did bloom, but it got really tall. And those two tall shoots with the, the foliage on it broke off at one point. And it, it was really, I don't know why it got so tall and leggy because it was in a good spot in the greenhouse. And then on the, the picture on the left here is what the parent plant looks like now. I repotted it. I put it in a bigger pot. Again, it's in a really sunny location and it re-sprouted. It has a whole new crop of leaves. But that's the two cuttings. Um, and I cut the stem in pieces and laid them down. And some of them are actually rooting, but these two pieces, which I put straight into the soil, um, rooted, and I just transplanted them into their own pots. And um, unless I give them away between now and May 25th, which is a possibility because whenever I go any place or people come to visit, I like them to go home with a plant. Um, but I, I should have at least one of these available as a giveaway. But I think they're really cute. And this is a kind of Tradescantia, and it's one of the more colorful ones. And it's also covered in flowers. Can you see all the little flower buds all over it? Not that the flowers are that dramatic. This plant is grown for its beautiful foliage more than the flowers, but still it makes me smile when I see that it's blooming. And I did take a bunch of cuttings from it and started another plant. So, um, that one, I, I think I put like 10 cuttings in a pot. So that one should be available as well. And if you remember a few weeks ago, we talked about, I, I showed you pictures of me pruning back the geraniums and the geraniums have been around for like five or six years. And I use them at the Ocean Grove house every year, cut them way back, fertilize them. And then I take, take the cuttings and root them. Uh, I have three giant pots of geraniums. I only really rooted the cuttings from one because that, that was enough and they take up so much room in the greenhouse, but I separated them and put them in individual pots and they're doing very well. So that makes me happy. And this is the uh, moonflower vine. And does anybody else have this trouble? I had a really hard time getting the seed case off some of them and I ended up it's ever so slightly damaging the foliage and trying to remove those hard seed cases. So I figured, well, I'll just let nature take its course and see if they will get shed on their own. But um, I was very pleased with the amount of germination I got. They don't always germinate so great. Uh, I will use probably four of these for myself um, and put them in the same spot I put them in every year. And hopefully they will grow up the trellis and be really magnificent. And I get to see them outside my bedroom window. But with a little luck, as long as nobody weed wax them, we should do uh, that. I should have some extra to give away. I think that's the end, right? All right. So um, 
we do have a few uh, people um, that are supposed to be calling in. So I'm hoping I will hear from them. They, they should know, but we're um, looking for my dear friend, Nancy from Piscataway, as well as, um, as well as Nancy from Piscataway. I have two Nancys calling in and Bob from Piscataway. So if all of those people, if any of those people could call in now, that would be much appreciated. And again, I'm going to give the phone number again. Um, comments. What was that? Comments. Oh, there's comments. Yes. So I got a few more comments. Um, someone said nice lemon harvest. Yes, that it really was. Um, so that that was good. And then Nancy said, good germination. I only got three out of 10 seeds. Yes, I was really surprised. Every seed I planted germinated. So um, I was, uh, no, that's not true. There were, I found two wrinkled in the ground, but I, I was very pleased with how we did. So I will have some, some extras. I planted them all, you know, just to make sure uh, more than I need, just to make sure I have enough. So. All right. So anybody calling in yet? Oh, somebody's calling. Oh, yeah, okay. All right. So. Stand by. All right. So let's go to those uh, images and it's, uh, are we ready? Uh, Nancy from, which Nancy is it? Oh, Nancy from Somerset. Okay. Nancy, how you doing? I'm well, thanks. I'm up here in Brooklyn, but I brought my phone. So <laughs> I'm able to tune in. Okay, well that's yeah. great because we have a lot of of pictures that you sent that were really kind of amazing. Can we can we do that little video first? Can we do that first? So we're going to do the little video first. Um, looks like you had a really great time in in Iceland. Uh, a lot of interesting stuff. So you sent me this little very short video, and I want to share that with everybody. And you were visiting a geothermal greenhouse, is that correct? Yes. It was, yeah, it was a complex that supplies basically a whole lot of the island with uh, fresh tomatoes every day. Do they grow anything besides tomatoes? They grow uh, cucumbers and summer squash. And they also, of course, have uh, basil plants. All right. Can we run that? That video? Okay, so this is it. It's not very long, but it's snowing outside the greenhouse. Run it one more time, please. So how cold was it there? Oh, um, it got down to, it was just like 30-ish um, um, when the snow, it was right on the border. Um, yeah, so it wasn't, it wasn't bad at all. I didn't need my heavy-duty cold stuff all right well let's go to the slides all right this is you you look beautiful who's your friend <laughs> yeah my friend ellie she's been my friend for over 50 years you look like you could be sisters all right <laughs> people do yeah <laughs> and what is this this picture of like the sky and a pipe spewing something and oh Oh, um, it, it, if you look down at the bottom, see all those glowing, um, yes, yellow, orange. Yes, they look yeah, like something out of a sci-fi movie. Is, yeah, this is um, this is from the sky. A drone. My yeah, hi, Rowan. My grandson just came in. Um, so they have eleven greenhouses. Actually, oh, I took a picture cool. of a picture. Oh, so is that a glowing? Uh, those glowing things are the greenhouses. Yes. Okay. Mm -hmm. Well, it's a very cool picture with the snow in the background. Very cool. It does look like it, again, it's mm -hmm. kind of extraterrestrial. All right. And <laughs> here we have, um, this is the the bees, right? The So it's a picture of six boxes yes. and yeah, they're the really bees, yeah. hives of some kind? Yeah, it's where the bees, you know, go back to rest when they're not pollinating the tomatoes. Do they make honey in those boxes? No. Hmm. Interesting. The bees don't, yeah, they didn't, uh, we didn't ask that question and they didn't offer um, an explanation. They just said these are, uh, you know, our, our workers and he pointed to the bees. 
Well, that's really interesting. I'm wondering if the boxes have honeycomb in them. I would just like to yeah, know that. That's, I don't know. Because that's what bees do after they pollinate, right? So, yeah, that's why they pollinate. Yeah, so right. yeah. Um, I would be and curious. Do you see on the right hand side that little container of cherry tomatoes? Yes. Um, yeah, that's what they um, harvest every morning and ship them out to the grocery stores. But they have they have large tomatoes too. We were just in the greenhouse with the cherry tomatoes. All right, and this is how they sell them. I love the packaging. The packaging is beautiful. It seems like a lot of packaging yeah. for tomatoes, yeah. but it is beautiful. And they actually, that's one of the things he mentioned is they try to be um, as conscious as possible of their packaging and they're working on having less weight. Ooh. Okay, <laughs> now the picture on the right, you've got to explain. It says tomate sorbet. Is that like... Yeah, it's tomato sorbet. Yes. It's <laughs> I'm sorry, <laughs> Nancy, you. that makes my <laughs> nose wrinkle. I mean, it's totally spontaneous. <laughs> I'm not even thinking about it. I read tomato sorbet and my nose wrinkles. It's like instantaneous. Um, <laughs> Uh, did you try it? Did you try the tomato no, sorbet? So we have no evidence no, that that we should not be wrinkling our nose. We have I mean, to, we have to order yeah, we yeah, that's that's really it. Doesn't the two in my mind don't go together at all? But if they're making it and selling it, somebody must like it. Okay, sure. next. All right, this is some of their other products. Did you try any of these? Um, no, that was just in the store. The one thing that I did try was their tomato IPA, which was very good. And um, they had tomato soup also. Okay, this so, is a, you know. I, I kind of took that picture and blew up each of the individual products. So that's cucumber salsa. And you said they, they do also grow cucumbers, right? So that's their own cucumbers. Correct. Okay. Mm -hmm. And then the first tall yeah. skinny one is a barbecue sauce. I bet that's, I bet that would be the one I would be most likely to try. Uh, a good tomato barbecue sauce sounds like it could be really yummy. And then the next one is tomato jam. That's like not not quite as dramatic as tomato sorbet. My nose is not wrinkled with that, but it's thinking <laughs> about it. Um, but that's that's kind of interesting. Tomato, it's a beautiful color, of course, which which is appealing. And then the last one is tomato drink. So they didn't call it tomato juice, which is very wise because what we think of as tomato juice is not tomato juice. It's pureed tomatoes in some way. If you squeeze a tomato and get the juice out, it's this kind of unpleasant colored, thin looking liquid. That's tomato juice. Nobody ever really does anything with that. Um, to make what we think of as tomato juice is, you know, pureed tomatoes and maybe thin down a little bit or something, but um, they call it tomato drink, which is probably more accurate. And you didn't try any of these or bring any of them home? No, I packed light and um... Yeah, I uh, I didn't bring any of them home. I was afraid of things breaking, the way my sucos got broken on the way home. So I didn't want any of this stuff. Well, I to, can't um, say that I, I blame explode. you for that. Um, you know, no. many years ago, I wrote an RFP, which is uh, when I was working, you know, as a consultant in the agricultural industry, an RFP, a request for proposals, for a tomato cooperative and um, it lasted about 10 years and then it went under and they did build this state-of-the-art jersey tomato sorting facility and shipping facility and the packing of uh, they would take you know the prime tomatoes and and i after that submitted another proposal and we uh received a grant unfortunately they <clears throat> succumbed before we were able to put this to fruition of making seasonal tomato sauce and having it be like wines where each year mm -hmm. would be a different combination and they could be you know it would be based on the excess tomatoes the tomatoes that are not perfect the tomatoes that could not go packaged as number ones and when they have an excess of tomatoes. There's a stretch in the summer 
almost every year where growers have so many tomatoes they can't get rid of them. And some of them get donated to food banks. So, you know, we need to give the farmers credit for that. But I had this idea of having an annual sauce. And so whatever else was extra that year. So if you put tomatoes and then you put, you know, some zucchinis and onions and peppers and you put different things in whatever is in excess that year and create a tomato sauce each year with the extra stuff. And then it could be labeled Jersey tomato sauce 19 99 and then whatever and I, I thought it was kind of a cool idea and it would make really good use of the excess product um but then they went out of business before it ever happened but i but this makes me think of that you know that you could make other products that um are tomato based and you just need to stretch your imagination and you can come up with all kinds of things uh they do have jersey yeah, fresh that sounds like great idea i yeah. i thought it was a great idea we got a grant for it but they ended up using the grant to do something else because the it all went belly up but uh yeah i thought it was a great idea and and the people that are at the food research facility they thought it was a fabulous idea they were all set to start trying and then it all shifted which was unfortunate but uh this makes me think mm -hmm. i haven't thought of that in years but this makes me think of that that it's kind of along the same line so um well if you ever go back i would be happy if you shipped <laughs> me some from iceland so we could show it um and i'd be really like, obviously you but can't ship the sorbet the, I the mean, one yeah the one thing that i wanted to just let people know um that picture of Ellie and I with the tomato plants in the background. Yes. Those plants are 33 feet long. Um, they take off all the suckers. They just have one stem that they um, wrap. They, they have a mechanism, a hinge mechanism. So the plant can go from 12 o'clock where it normally is. They move it down to three o'clock, which where the people are. And that way they can continuously wrap the tip entwine or curl the twine around the tip of the plant and um yeah they last 11 months before I've, and at the bottom at the you know if you look down well you can't see it but there's just this huge rope of tomato stems that are curled around each other um it's I've, amazing and then they have rails the pickers who pick the tomatoes every morning from seven to noon, and then they get shipped out, are on little trolleys. They sit on these trolleys that are on rails, and then they pick the tomatoes because the ripest ones are, of course, down at the bottom. Well, uh, it's in, amazing. In New Jersey, we have a fair amount of uh, greenhouse tomato production. And what I've seen them do is something similar, is that the tomatoes uh, are grown in bags. In bags of soil and one mm -hmm. I, I think they did one plant per bag and then they would do the same thing make them you know single stem and they would go all the way up to the top which is i don't know 12 feet something like that and then they would train them to come back down all the way down oh. and then they would train them to go up again a second time and by the time they got to the top the second time they finished and then they replaced them and they would use new bags of soil. The mm. soil would be depleted at that point. Um, that's what I've seen. in the Yeah. Community. If you look, closely, yeah. So if you look closely at that shot that you put back on, you see the twine around the stem of the tomato yeah, and it's grown in yeah, artificial me medium. Yeah. It's grown in an artificial medium also. Well, I did grow greenhouse tomatoes at the co-op that I managed down in Tabernacle. Um, and we had, uh, we grew them in bags and, um, it was a lot of fun. It wasn't as successful as this is, but, but we had tomatoes for sale at the same time as we had all the spring bedding plants ready. So it was kind mm -hmm. of an alternative bit of income and it was a way of us using, uh, extra greenhouse space that we had. So, um, so I've done it, not like this, of course, but. You know, it's uh, there's a lot that you can do 
with greenhouse production of tomatoes. And as I said, we do have several excellent greenhouse tomato growers in the state. So, I mean, New Jersey is famous for, um, it is famous for the Jersey tomato. Didn't we show these pictures last week? Did we? Yeah, I think so. Oh yeah, the Aurora. Yes, was, we showed We them. were so lucky. Yes, we showed yeah. them last week. So, is there anything else you would like to add to that? Um, no, I'm going to go home pretty soon and put my hands in the dirt. Um, I love my asparagus is coming up, which is fun. And uh, yeah, it looks like it's going to be a good day. Yes, it does. Yes, it does. And Tommy has just about finished mulching the blueberries. Thank you, Tommy, for doing that. Um, I did some, but he did most of it. And uh, uh, they're about ready to burst. There's going to be so many blueberries this year. So that job is mostly done. And then um, I, I think I might work in the veggie garden. And also I have the uh, the sweet box, the Sarco Coca. If you remember, I bought those plants in the fall and I had one huge pot and I divided it into five pots and overwintered them outside and they look great. So I may want to get them in the ground in the woods today. So that may be some, because then I might need some help and Tommy's mm -hmm. around, not around much during the week, oh, but he might be able oh, to help me today. Yeah. I have one other thing. I just was reading about elderberries and, um, I'm heading to the Poconos tomorrow, so I'm hoping that if I put a Google search in, I might find some place between Somerset and the Poconos where I can pick up um, an elderberry bush. I'd like to grow one, uh, get rid of a stupid hydrangea that is just taking up space and put an elderberry bush there. So if anybody knows of a local source of elderberries, could put it in the chat or call it in. Yeah, I, I, I don't think, I, I see that they're on Amazon and Etsy and all that other stuff, but I'd rather pick it up um, in person. Well, um, Jordan has multiple bushes. I can ask her where she got hers and she has propagated them. They propagate very easily. So mm. we can investigate that way. Yeah, and there are stems available on Etsy. Um, <laughs> yeah, just stems available. Right? I yeah. would try calling Mel. She she may have them or may know where to get them at Madden's okay. uh, Farm Market because yeah. she has a lot of cool stuff. And I'm I'm Great. sure also those two gigantic garden centers that I've been to would have them. And they're worth a trip. Barlow's over in Seagirt and then um, the farm up in um, Chatham. I bet you they would have them also. So... It's kind of a trip, but okay, it's a worthwhile thanks. trip because the places are so magnificent to see. So I'd try any of those places. All thanks. right. Yep. Okay, Nance. Yep. Drive, get home much. safe. Thank you oh. for the cool tomato pictures. And we'll talk soon. Sure. Okay. All bye right. bye. Bye bye now. All right, who have we got? Bob. Ah, it's Bob from Piscataway. Hey Bob, how you doing? Hey Bob. I'm doing well, Peggy. How how are you? I think I'm good. I think I'm real good. Um, we have some great pictures from you. Can we go down to Bob Seeds, please? So how's everything doing? Everything growing nicely? Yeah, every, everything's growing real nicely. Uh, the tomatoes are getting their first true leaves in now. Um, I started them later. I started them April 1st this year, all my seeds. Uh, on purpose, just as an experiment to see if I could get them ready before the, you know, planting season and not have them get too tall or leggy or, you know, outgrowing their pots. So, uh, you know, um, what I've been doing is every year I've been experimenting. Do you want to talk to Nancy first? Because I saw uh, yeah, the Yeah, apparently just up. Um, yeah. we're having a hard time. Uh, okay. Bob's seedlings, there they are. Can we bring that up right away? Should we go to Nancy first? Yeah. Can we talk to Nancy first? please. Yeah, sure. I'll put, I'll put my lovely wife, Nancy on. Yes. That'd sitting be right great. next to me. Uh, okay. Here she is. Thank you. Apparently we uh, lost that slide series of the seedlings. Um, so if we could take a look at uh, Nancy's slides first, please. All right. There we go. Good morning, Peggy. Good morning. How are you? I'm well. How are you? I'm good. I'm real good. Um, it's a beautiful day. What are you planning on working on today? It's beautiful. Yes. Um, 
I am going to clean and I'm going to make some mushroom meatballs and cook a nice dinner. Maybe invite my son and his family. I was just going to say, are are your sons coming today Um, for Sunday family dinner? That's such a nice tradition. Yeah. Okay. So let's take a look at this um, image that we have up here. Um, This uh, camper down elm. Um, You have fascinated me with this thing. And you want to tell everybody where you came across it? Yeah. So I was up in Massachusetts at Kripalu, which is a a yoga and meditation um, center. And I stayed there for four days and it was very wonderful and nurturing and healing. And I, I took a walk in between my yoga classes and I came across this beautiful tree that was just, it reminded me of an enchanted forest. It was just so beautiful. And then I saw the, um, that what you have on the screen, this little placard that explained what it was. And then I went back to the tree and just sat there a while and just kind of meditated with the tree and it was beautiful. And I saw at that time, Peggy would love this tree. And so I would, I lo- I would love this tree. Um, you are hundred percent correct. And I did a little bit more uh, digging what it says here. It's unable to self-propagate. And the reason it's unable to self-propagate is it was discovered around 1840 as a sport, meaning it just showed up in a, a nursery as an oddball. And um, wow. so that's how it got started. So it got moved to, um, to this uh, Dundee, Scotland, and it was, planted and it's still there. And the original camper down elm is only three to four feet tall. And you can't grow it from seed because if you grow it from seed, it's going to be half this one and half regular one because there isn't any other one like this. So the seeds will not be as dwarf or as small, even if it turned out to be viable, um, it would, it would not be the same. So the only way to propagate it is to graft it. Well, I don't know if anyone has ever tried to grow an original cutting from on its own roots. I couldn't find any information because if you could grow one, a cutting on its own roots, it would be equally small, but what they do with them is graft them onto other kinds of elms. And so then they get, as a result, they get in between. When they're grafted, Uh they get more energy from the rootstock, which makes them bigger. Uh, But because they themselves are genetically small, they don't get as big as a regular elm. And they're, uh, they're very contorted. Now, the one that you saw, which has a very sweet name, the grandmother tree, um, that's the one on the right, and that one's grafted. And the one on the left is the original one, which is 150 years old and only about four feet tall. So it's uh, Um, very, it's dramatically, they're dramatically different. But even when they're grafted, they only get to be about 13 feet, 14 feet tall. So um, I was very curious. And this, you sent me this picture of the grandmother tree. It's so beautiful. I mean, I would love yeah. to have one of those. And it would take a very long time to get that big. But And I don't even know if I have room at Tiny Farm for anything quite that big. But it's, yeah, um, it's but really I looked into beautiful. it. I, I did look into it. Do you want to add something about this tree? Did did you sit under this tree? I didn't sit under it. I sat in front of it, just away from it. Um, It was, the ground was really wet. I guess they had had snow the week before and all the snow, I guess, made everything wet and it was kind of marshy there. In front of it, I don't know what that was in front of it. If there's another picture I sent, it was like this 
I thought, is that from the leaves from the tree? It was like almost not like hay, but like long, long, long pine needles, um, mounds of it, just a little bit in the in front of the tree in the distance. In one of the pictures, you can see it a little bit that I sent you. Um, so, like, I started to walk on that, and then it got the ground got mushy, so I kind of stood away. That's and probably why they put that even. there. If it was wet and mushy, they probably protected it. Oh, okay. That would be my guess. Yeah. So, and then I sat further away and just sat and kind of. So here's a closer Used. look at the picture just to see the structure of the whole thing. It's really magnificent. I love contorted things. And of course, I just lost my Harry Lauder's walking stick, which was my favorite contorted plant. And uh, so I've been looking for something to replace it. So I went online and I searched and they they exist. You can get them. Um, but every place that I looked, they were out of stock. And there was a oh. range. There was a range. Like um, <clears throat> um, one place had them as low as $95. But of course, I'm not sure how big they were because they were out of stock. I didn't dig around. But um, <clears throat> most of them were running around online were running around the $250 price range. Um, but they are really quite magnificent. Uh, mm -hmm. This is the other picture you sent. This is also part of the meditation garden, right? This wasn't in the meditation garden. The Camperdown Elm wasn't. But the other way, yeah, that, that was a beautiful place. That was just beautiful um the you know the meditation beads the the um buddhist meditation beads there's like 108 beads i think well they're those stepping stones there were 108 of them oh and it went around in this big clearing in the woods and so you could step on each one and say a you know a bead prayer if you wanted or do a meditation so what was this place yeah. called? <laughs> it's Kripalu. It's um it's a really nice place. And where is it's a it? Really nice place. What? Where is it? It's in Stockbridge, Massachusetts. Massachusetts. And and it's um the food is great when you go, you get three meals and it's all really good 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 vegetarian vegan food and or a Vedic food, and they have some, they have some meat stuff way in the corner, but it, it's all very healthful. And you can, you don't have to do yoga. There are classes all day long, and there's meditation classes, and there's just talks, and there's sound bath classes, and there's saunas, and it's there's no, you're not no technology to, you know, they don't allow that. Um, so it's really healing. There's well, the want to go. <laughs> the place looks not this time of year, um, but the place looks lovely, and I'm glad that you got to experience yeah. it. All right, now yeah. I just I wanted to share this picture with you. Um, this is another one, uh, another of the same kind of tree, and this one is in Prospect Park in Brooklyn. And it's, um, wow. uh, and uh, so, you know, oh. in researching, trying to find it there, uh, it's also, you know, a very well-respected and much loved tree. If you look closely at this thing, clearly it's been cabled. Um, so it must be having some issues cause it's cabled in a couple places. Uh, but it's also another beautiful tree. And this one's I, also about 150 years old. So I will keep my eyes open if I come across one, because if I do um, come across one, I will probably get it. If I can find one locally, I will probably get it because we're not going to be here when it gets too big. So I might get it and find a, a, a special spot for it. What I would really like is one like the original one, which stays small. That would be great. And you could, if, if it was grafted, and it was and it was bigger than the original one, but anything above the graft would still be genetically 
the same as the original one from Scotland. So I'm thinking if anybody mm. got creative, they could take cuttings from the top portion. If they could root them, then it would be the same as the one, or theoretically, it would be the same as the small one in Scotland. And that's that yeah. I think would be really worth pursuing. Um, and that would make yeah. it easier to propagate because it would be bigger and more robust. So you could take more cuttings and then you could propagate it. But if you grew it on its own roots, it would go back to being dwarf. At least that's the, the theory that's running through my head. So, but magnificent tree, one I have definitely never heard of before. So thank you for sharing. Well, you're welcome. And thank you that now you'll get one and I can go and sit in your yard. <laughs> well, if that yard. works out, that would be great. <laughs> I will keep my eyes open for it for sure. But uh, based on everything I found last night, uh, certainly not a common tree, but you never know. You know, I found my uh, Siberian weeping pea shrub. So you never know. You might, I might just find it. I will keep my eyes open. You too. Let me know if you come yeah. across it. Okay. Okay. Love. Thank you. All right. Can I talk to your charming husband? Yep. Okay. Okay. Bye. Bye-bye. Hi, Peggy. Hey, Bob. We got the slides. I don't know what happened somehow with all of the slideshows I was putting together. I put it together. It was done, but it didn't make it onto the ready list right away. But here we are ready to rock and roll. Okay. Um, yeah, that's April. That's April 1st when uh, I first put the seeds in. Okay, um, these look like I they're use, all tomatoes. Is that right? Yeah, I I color code the markers so that all red is all tomatoes and the greens are all peppers. Well, aren't you clever? That's 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 well, very helpful. It makes it really easy. That way, when I look at the tray, oh, they're all red. That's the tomato tray. Okay. Really, no, I totally agree. It's like you know, at a glance, that's great. So, yeah, yeah. And then, you know, maybe you can't understand what I have marked, but I can understand because I use uh, abbreviations like Cherokee Purple. I'm not going to write the whole word on there, so I just put CP on there. And then that's, um, they came up, the tomatoes came up first. That's the pepper tray. And you can see the dews. I have pepper dews growing, Jimmy Nardello's, the Big Bertha's, Cherry Hot Peppers, Kerbachis, King of the North, Eco Eco's. Uh, so they're they're all coming up pretty good. They're all doing a pretty decent job so far. Um, but the tomatoes came up first. They came up. Uh, I planted them April first. They came up April fifth. Yeah, so, tomatoes uh, come first, then the peppers, then the eggplants. Eggplants, for whatever reason, yeah. take a lot longer to germinate. I don't know why, but but that's just fairly yeah. consistent from year to year. But these all look good. They look happy. Those uh, corbachis. You've got a couple of little tiny seedlings in the front that haven't shed their husk yet. And um, yeah, they uh, usually they do, but I'm having that problem with my uh, moonflowers that they are not. I've had that problem. I'm sorry. Go on. No, you you go ahead. Oh, I've had that problem with uh, my tomato seedlings, where sometimes they'll just stay stuck, and you know I'll give it a week or so. Okay, if it's not going to break open, I'll just gently try to, you know, break the piece off if I can without damaging the leaf. Yeah, you know, sometimes I, I don't know if I should interfere with nature, but you know. Yeah, I, exactly. I I tried getting them off on the. They did not want to come off the moonflowers, but uh, but these are still babies, so they they very well may yeah. still do that. Yeah, but, yeah. Um, sometimes you you do need to give a helping hand. All right, next. And look at these guys. They look awesome. All right, I want to know what Paul is. It's a Paul Robeson. Oh, okay. It's the Paul Robeson tomato. I could yeah, figure I out what it. most of okay, them were. Yeah. But I couldn't figure out that one. All right, yeah, next. Baxter Bush, Novas, which I really like. They're a little oval uh, cherry tomato with yellow stripes in it, but they're really tasty. Which one is that? And then, of course, RU is Rutgers, Damsel, San Marzano's, um, Gladiators. I do stripes? a lot of. Nova. There you go. Oh, Nova? I'm Where's sorry? Nova? I don't see Nova. Oh, Oh, the right, there it is in the, the right hand corner in the front. And yeah. Then super 100s. The peace sign in the back is for the peace vine. They're like a, a cherry tomato also. And then I have the Jersey uh, Devil, Black Crims, Jerky Purple, I have Brandy Wines, uh, Rutgers, 
damsels. I really like damsels. They're um, a pinkish baseball-sized tomato that I have never had any problems with, no diseases, um, nothing. And they're, they're delicious. They're tasty. Uh, so, you know, I like those a lot. And I like the Amish paste because they're very large paste tomatoes. They are a little bit to the pink, but they're very, very sweet. They're not as good for sauce as the San Marzano's aromas are, but they uh, they make a good sauce. I like when Nancy makes sauce. I'll separate <clears throat> the Amish from the other plums, you know, the Italian type plums, so that she'll make a sauce just out of Amish tomatoes. And you know, it's sweet. It's very they're very sweet, but they tend to be a little watery when you cook with them. All right, I have a question. So you do one one cell for each variety. Do you then separate them out? Yes. Well, you know, what I did a few years ago, like looking at the San Marzano, the SM in the front, <clears throat> I intentionally grew two of them close to each other. I will keep it that way and plant it as the plant grows. I will plant it that way <clears throat> as an experiment. And one year I did that and I had like a huge bush of San Marzano's because I had two plants growing together. Um, I don't know if that's a good idea to do that or not. But I did that on purpose with some of these cells just to give it a try because I'm trying to utilize my space a little more. So if I could put two plants right next to each other in the same hole, then, you know, I can maybe get more varieties in that way as opposed to planting four San Marzano plants individually. I see. Well, let me know how, how that works out. Yeah, yeah, it's going to be an experiment. I hope it works. If not, it's something I learned, and I won't do it again. All right, here we go. I love this picture. This is my favorite favorite picture because I think those little okras over there in the corner add personality to the shot from a from a strictly <laughs> aesthetic point of view. I think that that's a very cute picture. Um, so I also think it's very interesting that you wrote the word red repeatedly in green. I thought that was kind of interesting. Yeah, yeah. Actually, uh, there goes the. I just lied, I guess, because those are mostly tomatoes, <laughs> uh, and they're in green. So I guess uh, I think I did that because that's my son's tray. That's all his tomatoes I'm growing for him. He'll get that entire tray. Are the, the brown okras cherries, for him too? Oh yeah, 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 yeah. I'm not, I'm not a big fan of okra, so he asked me if I would grow some for him. Really? The brown cherries are just starting. To, yeah, yeah. I've tried it multiple times, and maybe it's the way we make it. I don't know. I mean, well, he'll probably give us some this year, and we'll try it again. Or He did grill it once, and it came out pretty good. We liked it that okay. way. Okra is um, one, one of my favorite vegetables. So I'm going to give you a couple. A lot of people say that. Yeah, yeah. I'm going to give you a couple of tips, and then do with it what you want. But uh, first of okay. all, the flowers are so beautiful because they are in the hibiscus family. It's one of the prettier plants to grow in the garden. So that's one thing. But the second thing is you can also eat them raw. And if you slice them like wagon wheels and throw them in a salad, yeah. they give flavor and a little crunch. Um, and because a lot of people don't like them because of the gelatinous goo that comes out of them, um, it gets completely lost in the salad dressing. You don't you don't notice it at all. Right, right. When when you serve it. Like oh, that. OK. Okay. But, but my favorite now, way to eat them, and I made a discovery, very hard to buy good fresh okra at the market because it just, it doesn't stay pristine for long in storage. And when they go to sell it, and by the time they're selling it and you get to the market, unless you get there the day it gets there, it tends to get a little black on it. And, and it's still edible, you know, for a while, but it's not as appealing. I've discovered frozen okra is the way to go. And I'm not a big, you know, frozen vegetable person, but they freeze okra at its peak so that when you use frozen okra, it's all perfect. So in the off season, when it's not harvesting it out of the garden, it's better to get it frozen. But what I, the way we make it and my husband, when last time I made this, he said, I could serve this every day and he'd be happy. So fry up a pound of bacon. Huh. I take the bacon out. I get rid of most of the bacon grease, but I make the bacon really crispy and then um, chop up some onions and the okra and the okra. I serve the okra whole, but cut the little hats off, throw that in the frying pan with the onions. And then um, 
when it's when it's cooked, crumple right towards the end. You crumple up the bacon so the bacon's hot again, and serve it over a bed of rice. It's one of my absolute all-time favorite meals. So, oh, interesting. So now um, I've never grown I've never grown okra before. Did I start these too early? Um, you started them because I didn't early. expect them to shoot up like that. Um. You did start them a little bit early. Uh, okra okay. is okay. Um, a heat and sun loving plant, even more than tomatoes. I mean, it, it it definitely it's like a southern crop, and it really likes it likes long hot days, so um, sunny days. So, and I generally, I have started okra in indoors to try to get a head start. Be, on the season, and I'm always been disappointed uh, because they don't transplant as well as other things. They don't transplant as easily as like tomatoes or peppers do. Um, oh, okay. Okay. Uh, it's a good crop to direct seed. It's an easy, easy crop to direct seed. Um, you can soak the seed in water overnight to help it germinate. But yeah. You can direct seed it, and um, and you you get a, a more viable plant that way. But Okay. I, have, I have started it. I would say, yeah, maybe you started it a little bit early, but as long as you give them plenty of sun, they should be okay. But if it doesn't work, if when you're ready to plant, if you're not happy with them, really just direct seed works pretty well. Yeah. I saved some of the seeds for that reason, just in case. Yeah. It's a good crop to direct seed. So. Yeah. Okay. That, again, you learn through your mistakes and, you know, he asked me to mistake. try this. So, okay. It's not a mistake. It's just you know. different, you know, it's a different approach. All right, so yeah. what are all these little the GCs are the GCs are ground cherries. Oh Again, he loves his his whole family loves ground cherries. They're just starting to pop up. They're a pain to grow. The seeds are so minute. Um it's really difficult to control how much you're putting in a cell. You know, if you just tap the pack, you're gonna get like fifty seeds fly out. Right. So uh I'm not a big fan of growing those, but once they they take off and I can individually pot them up, uh, then they'll grow really nice. The reds are the red racers that um, I've talked about on the show before. I get them from high mowing seeds, uh, organic seeds, and they're a very, very early tomato. Uh, I've had them as early as when I started them in the middle of March. I've had tomatoes by June 28th, you know, red tomatoes. So, uh <clears throat> Again, my son likes those a lot. I grew some for myself and my other tray, but that's his. And then uh, the GCs are the ground cherries, and then the okra. That's all he has space for. So, okay, well, for. for the ground cherries, you're right, uh, but they can also be direct seeded. But the other thing about ground cherries is if you grow ground cherries, a lot of times they will self sow, and you could just transplant them outside. Yeah. Yeah, we, we have them all over our yard. Right. Uh, I mean, they're everywhere. Yeah, so uh, we just, for us, you know, they, because they keep popping up every year in a different place, it's like, okay, I guess we got ground cherries this year, you know, so that's kind of cool. But uh, he wanted his own plant, so. So there you go. I do okay. that for him every year. And this is a close-up of the okra. I just think the okra plants are so cute. I love, I love the foliage, I think, um, uh, and you know there are several relatives of okra where you can actually eat the foliage. Huh? Yeah, I've yeah, never tried eating. I've never tried eating okra foliage, but um, I grew. I purchased a plant last year. I never actually got around to eating the foliage, but one that was a relative that was specifically grown for the foliage. And then rose the roselle, which is grown for the pods that look something like okra, only shorter and fatter. The roselle is grown to make uh, to cook and to make a liquid out of to make a beverage. And I bought the seed this year uh, again to, to grow it again this year. And on the seed packet, it said that the foliage is edible on that one as well. So the oh. whole plant world, the hibiscus plant world is one of the more fascinating groups of plants because you've got okra where you get a, a vegetable, a, a pod that you can eat with the beautiful flowers. You've got... Um, the roselle where you get a pod to make a beverage you can eat the foliage there's other 
varieties where you can eat the foliage and then there's the ornamental world where you have the giant hibiscus and then you've got rose of sharon's and then of course many people you're probably aware but many people are not aware that cotton is a hibiscus so it's such a amazing diverse plant group that they they um, have my respect and with the okra even if you don't like to eat the pods you can let the pods dry on the stem and they make great additions to dried flower arrangements so just such a diverse group of plants and with beautiful flowers and they get tall and sometimes red foliage and i just i love them all they're just really diverse but look at those cute little seedlings they make me smile just to look at them yeah, I, I felt the same way when I first saw them. Like, oh, this is different, and they're pretty. You know, they're nice, healthy, vibrant-looking plant. Um, again, though, uh, trying to control them before the weather, you know, it gets suitable for putting them in the ground, uh, may become a problem. So when I transplant them, like when I transplant my my tomatoes, I go all the way up to the leaves. So all of the entire stem goes in the in the earth. Um, or in the flower pot until I could get it out. Would I be able to do the same thing with okra or if they don't really transplant like that? Because I know you said they don't transplant well. No, I don't think they transplant like that. I think tomatoes are really the only thing okay. you can do that with reliably. Yeah, yeah. Okay, so I'll just put these in a pot and I'll probably get it to him as quick as I can and he'll be responsible for taking care of them. That so. sounds like a plan, Bob. That sounds like a plan. Yeah, yeah. But I That's have checked. Here's your seedlings. I have checked the weather here at least. There's no frosts in the uh, foreseeable future. So of course that could change because we could still get frost for a whole nother month. But if you keep right. an eye on the weather, you could maybe pot them up in something and put them out so that they get you know strong sun all day. Right. Right. And then as oh, long as you bring idea. them in if there is a frost scheduled, but as I said, you know, we've checked in the next 10 days, there's no, no nothing below the forties scheduled for my area might be a little cooler up by you, but not much. Um, so that might be helpful to keep them from getting leggy. Okay. Okay. That's a good idea. All right. Now tell me about this spoon. I love this spoon. It looks okay. like a giraffe. Yeah. I'm always looking to repurpose things. And I've been growing seedlings for a while now, for about uh, well, 10 years or so. And I came across this spoon uh, maybe about eight years ago. And this spoon is the baby spoon we used to feed my grandson with when he lived here. He's now 22. Um, and I realized that, you know, the curvature of that spoon, maybe this could be helpful with, with my seedlings. So uh, I tried it one time and to scoop inside the cells and, or to either get an individual, let's say, tomato seedling out of the cell. Uh, the flex It's not flexible, but the design of that spoon allows me to, to scoop down the wall of the cell and to dig under the ceiling and pull it, you know, gently scoop it right up in one piece with the dirt and everything. So uh, it's very, very handy. I, I like it also because it's a connection to my grandson, who I love very much. And I just think it's a, a neat thing that works really well. And it's, you know, I, I don't do without it every year. It's, and I have a little toolbox where I keep all my special uh, items for growing seeds. And that's in there and I use it every year. So I haven't used it yet, but as soon as the seedlings, you know, get a little bit healthier and taller, I will be using that to transplant. So, okay, well, it's, just, it's such a handy thing. I'm going to share with you that um, I have a xylophone that I installed for my chickens. I think I told you this recently that I, I have a xylophone, yeah. but of course they don't use the little, they're called mallets. We just learned that the little mallets to play it. They just peck at the, at the little metal bars to make a little noise. And, um, and I find those little mallets, which are just a stick with a round ball on the end of it, to be an amazing gardening tool. And um, because the stick end I can use to make holes for putting cuttings in the ground or uh, more shallow holes or even a stripe in the soil bed to put a row of uh, a, a row of seeds when I'm, you know, 
doing seeds in the greenhouse and I use rectangular containers, I might make a stripe and drop seeds down the whole stripe. And then the rounded ball end is great for tamping the soil down, especially for small pots like succulents. You know, it's just a little round ball and I can get in there easier and do less damage than if I'm trying to shove my finger down in there. Um, so that is one of my favorite tools, which is, you know, certainly repurposed. But here's the part that I want to share, share with you now is my friend came over on Friday night and we get together with them pretty much every Friday. And I have committed to giving a talk on, uh, I think it's going to be alliums in the summer and with her garden. Oh. And she informed me that I have to bring a gift for everybody in attendance. And there's usually like 30 people. She said, just something small. And they're paying me for this. So, you know. And so I went online and I found I can get a pack of these little mallets, 20 for $11.99 oh, wow. from Amazon. I'm okay. so excited. You have no idea that I'm going to be able to That's give them neat. out. So um, I'll get two packs. And I'll have some extras that I can share with my favorite gardening friends. So uh, you never know. Oh, that's very cool. Isn't that yeah. cool? I was I had never even yeah, thought that's... to look for them until she said I needed to give away presents. So um, and it, it's fun to use a tool like that, like what you're saying, or like this phone, because it's very unique. It's only for a specific reason or two. You know, I'll use the base of the spoon to do the indentation in the dirt where I want the ceiling to go in. You know, it's a multi-purpose tool, kind of. Uh, but it would be interesting to see, like, all your um, followers, if they could send in pictures of their favorite gardening tool. Any kind, whether it's outside, inside, whatever they utilize. Uh, it would be curious to see because you learn that way also you know there's a lot of different ideas out there who would have thought that xylophone mallets could be used in the plant world <laughs> i know i know so next week i'll make sure i have a picture to share uh of that and um maybe even i'll i'll use it um in a video or something but uh yes but i i love your little giraffe spoon i think it's adorable and again if you have an association with it that reminds you of your grandson that makes it that much better so um, I think that's yeah, your last yeah. slide, but thank you, Bob, for sharing okay. all that with us. Um, I think that we've run out of time. Have we gotten, we've gotten past the 11 o'clock hour, so we are done. Um, thanks. Thank you to you and your wife for spending so much time with us today and uh, have a great week and we'll be here next week. So have fun. Okay. Thank you, Peggy. All right. Thanks, Bob. Bye-bye. All right, so I'm going to, if anybody has an emergency that they need to ask me, I'll be happy if you want to call right away. I would be happy to answer any last-minute questions because I didn't want anybody to feel left out if they were waiting to call. The number here is 888-399-7344. Um, let's just end the show with that little five-second video of Alfie because he didn't even get on camera. And, oh well, now just speak of the devil. Here he is. So um, let's let's show that let's show that little video of him, just to end things. There he goes, stealing my glove again. He is a piece of work, this guy. So I'll be here next week, same time, same place. Until then, have a good one. Bye bye.